Dearly beloved, <laughs> we are gathered here today for Get to the Hook. Nice. Uh, welcome. I am your co-host, uh, Charles Latibaudier. And I'm your co-host, Eric Colley. And uh, as that intro uh, should be a perfect giveaway, uh, we are celebrating something today that, uh, look, we've spoken many times about how much uh, Eric and I love Prince. Uh, I thought I was maybe in the top 10 Prince fans ever. <laughs> and then I met Eric and I have dropped in the rankings. Let's just put it that way. I was as nerdy as I am about music in general. Imagine all that really specific about one person. Just about Prince, yeah. right. Uh, everything that I think I know about Prince, Eric knows and then tells me, <laughs> oh, and did you also know blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, all right, all I, I right. I can't help I'm sorry, I'm sorry I brought it up. Yeah. Um, so we are very excited to be doing this particular episode. It is the 40th anniversary of the release of the movie, um, which actually the anniversary was last week. Yeah, it's a, a Purple Rain. Yeah, it's this this whole year. It's the anniversary of the album, the movie, the song, that tour. It was just yeah a pop culture moment in time, and an one of the best best albums of all time. And something because it's the anniversary, I think something that is long overdue finally did happen. So we need to talk about that as well. Right. Uh, yeah, after a screening, the 40th anniversary screening in Minneapolis, Prince's hometown of, of Purple Rain, he was finally inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, which he should have been in so long ago. And uh, the woman who inducted him from the, the Hall of Fame revealed that he actually was voted in in 2013. Okay. But the Songwriters Hall of Fame has a policy that if you are a living songwriter, you have to show up to the ceremony. And when Prince, she said he got the most votes in 2013, but he couldn't show up that year. Right. And it just never worked with his schedule. And she goes, finally, they worked it out. He was going to show up in June of 2016 and be inducted. Oh. Of course, he died in April. Right. Now, why it's taken another eight years after that, I don't know. But finally, rightfully, he is in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Because all of his hits, he had 19 top 10 songs and many other classic songs. He wrote all of them. Right. And that's not even counting wrote them. all the songs he wrote for other people. Exactly. Uh, so many songs that he wrote. Um, it, it, it's crazy. But... That's the news. That's the thing that, that happened just now um, for Prince, like we said, long overdue. But we got to talk about Purple Rain and the release of this movie and the soundtrack. You know, last week, if you missed it, you should check out last week's episode. We talked about soundtracks um, and the history of them and why they're so important. Um, Purple Rain, we intentionally left out of that conversation because we knew we were going to do this. And it is... Uh, it, it, it's not even, to call it, it a soundtrack. It's, it's, it's the soundtrack. One, because it's all a Prince album. Uh, and it's, it's regarded as one of the greatest albums of all time. When, when Rolling Stone revised their list of the top 500 albums of all time, it was in the top 10. When Apple Music did their list, it was in the top five. It is just one of the greatest albums artistically, commercially, influentially. Everything that could be good about an album is this album. It is the rarity, um, especially now, rare. It wasn't as rare years and years ago, but one of those albums that you can listen to start to finish, you know, if you're really old, you can put it on, put it <laughs> on the turntable and let it and then flip it over and play yeah. it again. If you're listening, if you're streaming it, you can listen front to back or top to bottom, one through nine. It is and, no skips. Yeah, there are ex exactly no skips in this whatsoever. And that's a good tease for at the end of this, we are actually going to do something that I found very challenging. We're going to rank all <laughs> nine tracks oh. on Purple Rain. We'll, we'll each have our own our own ranking. I have not I, shown I, Eric I my just list. My, I just picked a number one, and that was really, really hard. But... Oh, you picked a number one? I actually went through and ranked them, and it was okay. I, I, what was so hard about it was to say that I don't like this song. And no, I like it. It was songs. hard to say that you don't like any of the songs because they're all immensely listenable. But that aside, it is an important album just for um, what it did for Prince, obviously. Absolutely. And it was because... very deliberate. And, 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 I, and a lot of Prince fans actually kind of hate Purple Rain, the album at this point, just because they're so tired of hearing about it. Because for most people, that's where their knowledge of Prince begins and ends. Right. The man made almost 40 studio albums in his lifetime, not to mention all the albums he did for all of his associated artists, where he wrote and produced everything and performed all the instruments. Yeah, Purple Rain is sort of overly outsized in his catalog. It's, it's but the, it, it's it the is cornerstone. a great album. It is. Right. There's there's so many great records. So check out more of his discography if you don't know it. Uh, but yeah, this this album he this was a, kind of a make or break thing for him. This was his sixth album. A lot of people think it was his first. <laughs> right. Uh, and he had been building an audience. He had an R and B audience. Critics loved him. 
finally, the year before Purple Rain, he had a commercial breakthrough with the 1999 album with Little Red Corvette, the title song, and Delirious. And his contract with his management was ending right as he was hitting that commercial breakthrough that people thought was going to happen. And he had designed this whole thing to level up to Icon, and it involved a movie. And he told his management, if you don't get me a movie, I'm not re-signing. And why would Warner Brothers... And why would one make a movie with yeah, this guy this, who... this weird kind of left to center like you know, outsider, friend, right. pop star, cult star, who finally had a couple of pop hits. Now uh, they're suddenly uh, the going to make a movie. And, uh, a guy you, they, they couldn't really put in a box. He's a, a black guy from Minnesota who isn't necessarily, he's not playing straight R&B. No, he's not he playing does soul. do R&B. He does. He does. But it's kind of rock. And funk so they're and like, rock and I can, punk and... I can imagine the, the, the movie studio execs going like, huh? No, there's no way we're putting money right. into this. And also at this time, Prince does not do interviews. He's very mysterious. People don't, he's so weird, but that's why it worked, I think. Warner Brothers agreed to go ahead and let him do the movie, and he knew this was a make or break. If this movie failed, that would have been the end of his career, basically. He would have been a fringe artist right. the rest of his life. He put everything he had into this. This was so carefully designed to be a commercial breakthrough. And what is amazing about it is, it absolutely was. It works as just a great pop record. And he made a mainstream album, but it's still so weird. He, it's not like he sold out or compromised his princeness. He just, brought the mainstream to him. Right. He's like, he, I'm weird, and you and think I'm cool, he, and yes. <laughs> he, he built, like, I, I want to say, like, he's an architect of this perfect beast, <laughs> this perfect machine that he created where there were some straight sort of R&B songs. There were um, uh, incredible pop songs that he knew this is going to get played on the radio. And then you're right. He still mixed in his weirdness, so yeah. that exposed people to that, and by the way, the, the record was such an immense hit, it also allowed him to introduce people to some of his other songs in his back catalog, Right, because back then, boys and girls, there were <laughs> things called singles, and, um, and so you'd have on one side the hit that came from Purple Rain, but then he put some older songs on the, on the B-side. And you had all this, The Time and, and Sheila E., all of his other artists he was doing. But, and he told his band when they were making the movie, he's like, get ready, this is going to change our lives. And it did. Uh, but talk about the weirdness. And this is what's so amazing about all of this. That it, it's unbelievable that this all worked. So Warner Brothers, the film studio has this, this movie they've invested in. They have this album. They have this artist who's on the verge of a breakthrough. It's just all, they really have a lot invested in this, you know, financially, of course. Yeah. And just as an artist, they believed in him. And the very first opening salvo of all of this, the first single came out before the album, before the movie, Warner Brothers was having a panic. <laughs> They're like, what have you given us? And you can understand why. Yeah, it, it is, it, Prince is a black artist. They considered him R&B, although he was not. So it's an R&B artist making a dance pop funk record, pop. and it has no bass line. <laughs> so this is everybody knows this song it wound up actually eventually becoming the biggest hit of 1984 and the biggest hit of Prince's career which is no small accomplishment when you look at what came out in 1984 yeah so, a lot so number right. one for five weeks this is When Doves Cry why do we scream at each other this is what it sounds like when doves cry so when Prince was mixing that song there was a bass line he did record one and he pulled it out of the mix and he thought, oh, that's it. Because the song, and also for a pop song that came out in the summer, it's about isolation and loneliness yeah. and the fear of being like your parents who are in a terrible relationship and you're carrying on these patterns of abuse and trauma. Not what you talk about in a pop song usually. No, definitely not. And he thought by taking the bass out, it made the song very cold and very stark because you just have his lyrics about this isolation butted right up against the keyboard and this thundering drum beat. And it just sounded like, and it does sound stark and cold. It does, and, and, and it is a very, it was such a unique sound that, I, honestly, it was probably a couple of years after it came out that someone said to me, you know, there's no bass line in it. Right. Like, I never even, it didn't Don't even occur notice to me. It. It, the, the, the drum beat is what you're really moving to. And then the other thing that it really benefited from, we've talked about this, MTV. Mm -hmm. Because the imagery in the music video of him crawling out of this, bathtub and crawling across the floor naked like it <laughs> it caught your attention for yeah, sure it got everyone's attention and so everyone was talking about it and the sound is so unique and one of the things he did and this is when people talk about prince being brilliant or a genius and some people are like what's so great about this guy it's little things one taking the bass line out which it's weird that removing an instrument is genius but it is and also if you listen to the drums everybody was using it was called the lynn drum machine in the 80s everybody used it prince's always sounded different because being a multi-instrumentalist 
he ran the drum machine through his guitar effects pedal. So like that like weird flangey reverb sound that he had in his drums, it's because he was using guitar effects on the drum machine. Well, nobody else that programmed drums knew how to play a guitar and do that. Right. So he had this See what very I mean? unique See what sound. I mean, ladies and gentlemen? There, there's Eric just going, <laughs> again, just a, just a little bit deeper yeah, and uh, in what the, you're the hearing. The story's about this. So uh, Matt Fink was Prince's touring keyboard player, Dr. Fink, because he famously dressed as a doctor back in the 80s. That was his shtick. Uh, Matt Fink has talked about this song. There's this keyboard solo towards the end, and it's this really Baroque, classical-sounding. Yeah. It's, it's fast. It's <laughs> difficult to play. And so Matt Fink, the first time he heard the song when Prince, because Prince played all the instruments on the record, he was like, Crap, how am I going to do that? <laughs> so Prince just made him, he's like, you, got, you have to, we got to tour this. So he practiced and practiced and got it. Once he got it down and could play that solo, he said, Prince told him, yeah, actually, when I recorded it in the studio, it was so hard to do. I played the record at half speed and played the keyboard solo an octave down so that when I sped it back up, it would sound like I wanted. <laughs> and now I want you to actually yeah, do it so live. I did you, it with machines. Yeah, he slowed, now... it, he slowed it down and played it a little bit slower so he could do it in the studio, but didn't tell him that until after he had learned to play it because that's what he expected of his band. See, that's how he got the most out of his band. He really did. <laughs> the, the guitar solo, Wendy Melvoin, his guitar player, she was 19, had just joined the band in 83. And she has this like searing, like almost heavy metal guitar solo. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, learn that. We're going on tour. And she's like, it took me forever. It was hard. Pretty, pretty amazing way to kick off the album. And, and I think that just built so much anticipation for the album. Never mind. Then the movie came out. Yeah. Is... Then, then people, you know, it was a glimpse into his world that you never got to see. He, his aura of mystique was always his thing throughout his entire life. And it's a fictional movie, but there's enough autobiographical right. things in it that some of it's true. He shot it mostly in Minneapolis. His band's in it using their own names. There's a lot of truth to it, but there's also a lot of fiction. And to this day, some of it's not clear really what the line was. What, what, uh, what are the clearly fictional parts of the... One thing that always stuck with Prince, in the movie, his parents are, are a biracial couple. And so people always assumed Prince was biracial. He is not. No, both of his parents were black. black yeah. Um, yeah, there's just little, little things like that. Just people always assume is the, it's true. Is the, uh, this is spoiler if you haven't seen the movie. <laughs> is the suicide attempt... No, that's 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 fictional. Yeah, right? it's fictional. Yeah. That's just drama for the movie. Right. Um, yeah. So the, when Doves Cry, it's it's one of those rare instances where something is a massive, inescapable pop hit, and it's also a highly respected piece of art. Like it is a if if that wasn't a pop hit, you'd still respect like wow, what a brilliant avant garde kind of yeah. work that is. And it clicked with people, and it set him apart instantly from every other mainstream pop star. I think Prince, as big as he was, could have been commercially even bigger if he wanted it. He just. Preferred but he to be never, a weirdo. Right. He said, I'm going to make my sound. And it was always just a little bit different from what everyone else is doing. But still immensely listenable yeah. on the radio. And that's what this whole album Yeah, so really the whole is. album starts. Once you get the record, the, the first song on the album is actually the second single and was his second number one hit. And, I mean, he opens the album with a weird sermon with this organ and the whole Jilly Beloved. We were gathered here today. It's this thing called Life. And this is Let's Go Crazy. Let's go crazy. So here's something that Swifties can relate to. Um, and I didn't see the Eras Tour movie, um, but I've heard <laughs> and seen videos of people in the theater standing up, dancing, and singing along. I've never, ever experienced that until I saw this movie. Right. It the, was like a concert. It's a movie, but there's was, a lot of concert performances in the movie. Everyone in the theater was standing up, dancing along. And they weren't singing at first, because, and, and from the first song, it, would, it opens yeah, It opens Let's the movie crazy. also, Let's Go Crazy. Um, and everyone was just up and dancing. And they didn't know all the lyrics at that point, um, but the third or fourth time I saw it, they did know the lyrics, and everybody yeah. was singing along. So. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's, it's, remember the year before, so Michael Jackson had just come off a thriller, and one of the things that really helped that album cross over and be so big was Beat It, because Michael Jackson got Eddie Van Halen to play the guitar solo, so he got metalheads checking him out, and, yeah. and you know, pop fans and R&B fans. Prince did the same thing here, but he didn't have to get Eddie Van Halen. He just did the guitar solos himself. He played himself. it himself, right. The, I mean, the, the solo at the end of Let's Go Crazy, he just shreds. It is, it's crazy. It is. Yeah, I mean, people forget what an incredible guitar player he is. Yeah, well, well he reminded them with the... Hall of Fame induction. Absolutely. Uh, one of the other lasting impacts of, of the Purple Rain album that a lot of people don't know is a song that wasn't even a single. It's one of the most famous songs. Foo Fighters have covered it. Everybody loves this song. Uh, it's a song called Darling Nikki. And <laughs> the thing that's so famous about this song 
uh, is that Tipper Gore, who was you know, Al Gore's Al Gore's wife, wife at the time, he was not vice president yet. Uh, she was one of the congressional wives. Bought the Purple Rain album for her 11 year old daughter and heard her listening to Darling Nikki and lost her mind. And she's like, "How can we let children hear things like this? Why was there no warning on this?" This, this in particular, this is the opening lyric of Darling Nikki, and this is what set Tipper Gore off. Knew a girl named Nikki, I guess you could say she was a sex fiend. I met her in a hotel lobby, masturbating with a magazine. Oh, he said masturbate? Woo! All right, well, I'll admit, when I played the album, I certainly, if my mom was home, I would turn that down because I just knew <laughs> I knew it would be an issue. It seems so tame now. I just knew it would be an issue, and so I just never ever went there. So she never even knew about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you had <laughs> Tipper Gore in Congress going, "We need to. We got to save the children." A quick funny story. So when this came out, my my brother's five years older than me, so he was in his teens then, and uh, so I was listening to his cassette and I heard it and I didn't know what it meant, and so I asked my mom, "What does masturbate mean?" And she goes, I don't know, ask your brother. Maybe he knows. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I, I don't know what that means. And then I had to look it up in a dictionary to find out. Oh, God. So I knew what it meant. I still didn't really understand it. But uh, Wait, was your mom taking a shot at your brother when she I, said that? I, in <laughs> hindsight, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think she was. He's a, he's a teenager. Uh, yeah, Tipper Gore freaked out. They had congressional hearings. This involved, uh, people came into the hearings. Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister, Frank Zappa, Glenn Danzig, John Denver yeah. came in to defend. They thought this was censorship, that you're yeah. trying to restrict what artists can and can't say. And and they did end up putting the, the stickers so on. So the labels created to the parental advisory sticker, you know, the famous, the black and white old yeah. parental advisory, explicit content, explicit lyrics. But here's the thing, it just made those records oh, yeah, sell more. Them. <laughs> they, yeah, people wanted yeah. them more. But so those, the, the parental advisory sticker happened because Tipper Gore heard her daughter listening to Darling Nikki and thought parents need some sort of warning. And the funny thing is, years later when Prince was asked about it, because he never went to the, the congressional hearings yeah. or anything like that, he was fine with it. He's like, yeah, parents should know what their kids are listening to. He never objected to it. Nobody censored him, stopped him from saying what he wanted to say. And by the way, it's just a great song. Aside it's a from great that line, song. It does, I will say, I always say everybody, everyone's name, almost everyone's name, there's a song with your name in it. Yeah. Right? Oh, if your name's Nikki. And I have to admit, every time I've met someone named Nikki, it's the first thing I think. Of and course. then I have to decide whether or not I tell them that. Yeah, if they're cool with it. Other, other one real quick thing about Darling Nikki, which is so funny and just shows Prince's cleverness and everything. This was also in, in the 80s here was the era of backmasking when parents were terrified that satanic lyrics were backwards hidden into tracks. After Darling Nikki, this song about a sex fiend masturbating and her rocking Prince's world, at the end of the song, it goes into this weird backwards thing where it's like mm -hmm. this choir and it's all reversed and it sounds creepy and they're like, oh, it's satanic and it's the end of the sex song. When you play it forward, it does sound kind of <laughs> like it is. But yeah, so when you play it forward, what Prince is actually saying, it's all his voice multi-tracked. He's saying, hello, how are you? Fine, fine, because I know the Lord is coming soon. Right. It's a message about Jesus at the end of this song about finding redemption after sex. It's the first time that I, because we are listening to it on a turntable where I went. And I oh, yeah. Play it backwards. You gotta put your finger now, and turn way, it backwards. My mom never heard the beginning of the song where Nick where he's talking about Nikki masturbating, but she did hear me doing it backwards. She's like, <laughs> what are you doing? What is that? And I was like, Oh, don't worry about it. It's, it's fine. About Jesus. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. It's, a, it's a religious record. Yeah. Um and there were so many good songs on Purple Rain. And this is what just how prolific he was from eighty three to eighty four, from right around the end of the nineteen ninety nine tour to the end of the Purple Rain tour. Prince by himself wrote produced, performed all the instrumentation, and did the demos, if not the vocals, for the Purple Rain album, the Times album, uh, Ice Cream Castles, which had Jungle Love and The Bird on it, mm -hmm. Apollonia 6's album, Sheila E.'s Glamorous Life album, wrote songs for Sheena Easton, uh, Sugar Walls was her hit, wrote songs for other people, put together the Family's album, which had Nothing Compares to You on it, that's where that song originally wound up, right. and also wrote and recorded the follow-up album to Purple Rain, Around the World in a Day, which came out just 10 months later, <laughs> and made a movie and did a tour. Yeah. In a year. Right. Actually, and, wait, did, when, and when did he do the Under the Cherry Moon? So that was 85. He started filming that in early 85. Right. There was no break. That's why there's so much yeah. unreleased material. So Prince was so, putting out so much music, and you know you could only get nine songs on the record. So a lot of the songs wound up as B-sides. And if people don't know what a B-side is, back in the day, a physical vinyl 45 single would have the A-side is the song, you're, the hit right. you want to buy, and you got to flip it over and play the record on the other side. Most artists just put another album cut, uh, some would maybe put an instrumental of the A side, yeah. but people like Prince, who had a lot of extra songs, put totally brand new songs 
that would only be on the market for a couple months, as long as the single was for sale. And once it was gone, it was gone. And his B-sides, some of those became hits. Became classics. Like, if you right. buy a Greatest Hits Prince album, you'll hear some of these songs. Yeah. Right, Melissa, I'm going to jump to Erotic City here. Um, so, Let's Go Crazy. The B-side of that is one of his most famous club songs, because the bass line on this song is so killer, and it's <laughs> such a Prince title. Here's Erotic City. I mean, radio used to play that. Yeah. There's some objection I lyrics. Was, I was like, wait, did they just say the F word? But Or did they? Clever. Sheila says, so Sheila is we saying that. We can funk and She says gone. funk. Right. But, but Prince, I bet you he wrote it as the other word. You know, who knows? Yeah. It's, it's, it's whatever you want to hear. Uh, and then there's another B-side. This was the flip side of When Doves Cry. And I'm playing this just, I was like, which one of these do we play? And I'm going to play both because I love this song. And sometimes people think, if, oh, if it's a B-side, it's because it's not as good. No, it's just because it didn't fit in the movie, it didn't fit on the album. When Prince was making the Apollonia 6 album that had Sex Shooter on it, the best songs for that album, he didn't give them. He wrote Manic Monday for Apollonia 6. <laughs> but mm, I'm not going to give this to them. Wound up giving it to the Bengals, became a huge hit. Wrote a song for them called 17 Days. And there's a reference to the song about having two cigarettes because one of the members of Apollonia 6 smoked. Prince never did. Right. So he wound up, he recorded the song, intended to give it to them, wound up not doing it, and put it on the B-side of When Doves Cry. And it's one of his best songs, period. Uh, this is 17 Days. It's like a little, there's like a, this gliding funk bass, a yeah. little reggae guitar, these warm synthesizers. It's, I love that song. And he's like, eh, B-side. Eh, throw it on the B-side. We'll see. Who did that? <laughs> Someone who has so much material that right. he can do that. Right. All right. You wanna, before we, we'll talk about the title track last. You got to end with it, just like the movie did. Yes. It's like the album. You know, you got to end with with Purple Rain. But let's let's talk about the, the favorite songs. I want to know your ranking. So, <clears throat> all right. Here's here's my ranking. <clears throat> I, I don't want to see. There's nine songs on the record. So I'm going to start with no, from nine to one. Okay. Number nine, I would die for you. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Computer Blue. All right. Take Me With You. Why do you hate these songs? I, I know. That's the, I realize because I realize that's what I'm saying. Is that such I don't great like, songs. All these songs are tens. Right. Uh, so let's see. Take Me With You at seven. Number six, Let's Go Crazy. Number oh, not even top five. Wow. Number five, Purple Rain. Mm -hmm. Darling Nikki. Four. When Doves Cry. Number three. All right. Baby, I'm a Star. That's your number two. So I'm going to pause you here before we get to number one. Uh -huh. because I, I well, can't you know what them. it is now. Well, also because people always ask me, because they know I love Prince, like, oh, what's your favorite Prince song? Like, How do you pick uh, from a guy that I, did yeah, R&B and pop and just sweaty funk songs and blistering rock songs? How do you pick a favorite? Yeah. But if, if, like, gun to my head, I could only listen to one Prince song for the rest of my life and everything else would go away, it would be this song. And honestly, might be my all-time favorite song at, by anybody. At number one... On my ranking of Purple Rain. And mine too. And Eric's, the beautiful ones. The beautiful ones you I it, cannot listen to that song without getting chills. Every, 40 years later, I, I, no matter how many times I've heard it. The, the vocals are, I mean, we just played that note, which is incredible, that but there are other you. vocals in the whole song that... That's not a song you're ever going to hear someone sing in karaoke. No. Because you, you can't. Mariah Carey did a cover of it with Cisco, and, I mean, she's Mariah Carey. She can sing, but yeah. nothing can touch. I mean, I'll try and keep this brief, but that song, to me, it's, it's an experience. It's not even a song. If you listen to it start to finish, and it's one of these songs, and it's not even because I have, like, a personal attachment. Like, it wasn't, like, a relationship or reminds right. me of something. But, honestly, I will tear up listening to this song sometimes just because it's so... It's just raw emotion. Let's play the whole thing. I want to oh, see God, Eric I cry. Wish we could. I want to see yeah. Eric cry. Come on. <laughs> but like, it starts, you know, it's got this, just this like tumbling drum machine and these like weird, very cold right. keyboards. It sounds you like a computer You don't know where glitching. it's going and then. And then these warm pianos come in and he's got this falsetto and just floating. It's sort of like flirty and light. Yeah. Like he likes this girl. She's with another guy. She also likes him. So he's like, you know, is it him or is it me? Who do you pick? And it's this, I mean, beautiful melody. And there's three minutes of that, which that would be fine. And then it just, he just kicks it into the stratosphere at the end of that song. This guitar comes in, and what started is kind of sweet and flirty, and, and one part he even goes, you know, if we get married, would that be cool? Just kind of casually proposing right. to her. And then he starts to realize maybe she's not going to pick him. 
and he starts and getting it gets mantic, or manic or manic and like frantic and it, it, it just, it's almost frightening angry it, it almost yeah, it turns obsessive. kind of stalkery at it's the sinister end. he right. starts he starts like he drops the falsetto and is like is it him or is it me and starts yelling and then like the, the guitar comes in and there's like this guitar kind of just wailing behind him and the keyboards keep building and he just lets out this inhuman scream it's a wail this wail yeah. of just pure raw emotion and then the whole thing builds and builds and hits this one note and then just slides back down into like the drums just tumbling and that keyboard all cold and it just leaves you like out of breath at the end yeah I, I, that song is, it's not even a song. It's, it's an, it's an experience. Masterpiece. It's an, it's a masterpiece. A masterpiece. It's a perfect right. song. Yeah. But, all right. The, the song, the song that after Prince died, everybody gravitated towards, mm -hmm. the one everybody knows it's his most streamed song, Purple Rain. And do you know what Purple Rain is? Like what the meaning of it is? I don't. Because, I, I mean, I actually, I've always, I always thought of it as, um, Sadness. It is, and it, but it's it's a joyful sadness. If you listen to the lyrics, it's like, I never meant to cause you any sorrow, never meant to cause you any pain, only wanted to see you laughing, bathing in the, in the purple rain. rain. Right. So it's at the end of a breakup. And you know, as a kid, I love the song. It's a beautiful song. But I'm like, I don't know what purple rain is. What does that mean? He explained it one time, and Prince rarely explained what his songs meant. And it's, again, his genius as a writer, as just a weirdo who thinks outside the box. He's, he was also you know, a very religious person in his right. way. In the book of Revelation, it says, you know, when the second coming happens and the end of time comes, the sky will fill with the blood of the lamb. And Prince goes, the sky's blue, blood is red, it'll rain purple. So the song is saying, you and I had a relationship and it didn't work out, but I still love you. And when the end of time comes, I hope you're happy. I hope you've had a good life and I just want to see you happy and bathing. And now I'm going to- Holy crap. And now I'm going to cry the next time I listen to Purple it's, Rain. It's, Although it's, I will say I cry a lot when I listen to Purple Rain because I do- So many reasons. I connect it to not just the loss of Prince, but also- to relationships. And, oh, there's so many yeah. personal moments in my life that this song is tied into. I, I'll probably have it played at my funeral, but uh, so now, now that you know what it is, here's a little bit of Purple Rain. Purple Rain, Purple Rain. I told my wife, I'm like, yeah, my funeral, either Purple Rain or Erotic City. <laughs> I don't, eh, you know, maybe both. <laughs> maybe both. Maybe I, might, both. I might have to edit my own medleys before I, I go. Just I, don't, play. I don't want to do too much more <laughs> funeral planning here. Um, <laughs> so Whatever. we should wrap it up. I, I, I just got to, I mean, I know, obviously, we've talked about it for both of it. It was a life, literally a life-changing moment to listen to this album, to own the album, to watch the movie multiple times. It's probably the first time I went to to a theater to see a movie more than once. It's the first time I saw boobs in a movie. And, <laughs> and you and never forget boobs. that. By the way, I will. I got a shout out. I'm glad you brought that up. That's why Take Me With You um, got number seven on my list. Because that's the scene where Apollonia that's the scene where Apollonia. Lake Minnetonka. Or not Lake Minnetonka. <laughs> Not Lake Minnetonka, uh, yeah. exactly. Um, yes, we can always shout out to uh, Apollonia. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but yeah, one of the, one of the greatest albums of all time. I think it always will be. I think people for generations will discover this album, and there's As so many layers should. to it, so much to check out and just discover with it. Yeah, it has become such an iconic thing in pop culture, and we can't forget. Maybe the thing that made Purple Rain even more legendary was that Super Bowl performance. Right, like how? What could you have more perfect? He's playing Purple Rain, the song that everybody wants to hear. The sky opens up, and it's just... And the rain is coming down, and the lights are making it purple. It's Prince everything. at the Super Bowl. That's why I, I say it's the best halftime show, not just because I love Prince. I think it's the circumstances of that. Theatrically, it became... Nobody else can compete with that. That was nature putting on the show. I mean, you can't compete there with that. There you go. Nature, God, everyone loves Prince. <laughs> you should, too. That's our message, uh, and that's right. it for this week. We'll see you next week on Get to the Hook.